ready to get started. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Dolores Wellish, and I'm the Director of Marketing here at Vicon. Today we are presenting Vicon Valera's VMS version 18.2, covering new features that enhance our system performance. Today's presentation will be given by Guy Arazi, who is the Director of Product Management here at Vicon. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during our presentation, please type them into the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel, as we will have some time at the end to answer some questions. And now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn the time over to Guy Aranzi. Thank you, Dolores. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, it's great to be speaking with you all today. I just looked at the list of names, and there's a good uh, good number of names that I recognize from uh, older times and uh, a few new ones, so I hope we're going to have a good presentation. Uh, I'm going to switch now to control the presentation, and uh, we're going to start going. <clears throat> Let's take a quick look at uh, the agenda of what we'll be talking about today. Um, I'm going to give a very brief uh, introduction of what Valeris is and what we're doing for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, then we'll do a demo of uh, the Valeris VMS, highlighting really the new features in this version 18.2. I'll explain a little bit about this version, what we're doing. We'll talk about the tiers and the licensing and upgrading to these new features. And at the end, we want to give you a taste of uh, some of the new cameras that we're coming up with, out with and uh, allow you to see where things are going as far as Vicon is. Those of you not familiar with Vicon, uh, a few words about the company, what we do and who we are. Vicon has been and still is a solution provider. We have offering on of all the different components for security needs. We have a VMS, we have an access control system, we offer high-end cameras, we'll show more of those at the end. We offer computers and we offer storage. We can provide those as components to your security system or we can provide them as one system and a one-stop shop type of uh, solution. Valerus, our VMS today, is really what we're here to talk about. And this version is the fourth release in the last uh, give or take two years. It is also the second full-size VMS solution that Vicon has ever developed and deployed. Those of you who know us from uh, the older days know our Viconet VMS. Valerus is its replacement. And this uh, webinar is about 18.2, which is the fourth generation right now. We offer a simple, cost-effective solution that has great flexibility and scalability. The whole, whole idea behind Valeris is to provide a solution for any size and also to allow people starting with a smaller system to easily grow it without any confusing or very complicated models of doing so and with offering a system that's really catering to those stakeholders that we have around the system, the installers, the administrators, the users. All of these people are ones that we think about when new features are introduced and we try and make it not only sophisticated, uh, but also simple and easy to use. So Valeris 18.2. Uh, in this version, like in former versions, and basically what we're trying to do around the clock is to offer uh, in every version a few, call them major features, bigger ones, uh, but at the same time not to forget that there's enhancements and maybe fixes of older features and plenty of feedback from you, our users, uh, telling us we'd like to see something enhanced this way or we'd like to see something that changed which is already there. So you'll see a nice mix here out of these different features that we're looking at of larger, big features that are more uh, robust and smaller features that may be cosmetic in their basis, but allow a better ease of use, better access to the system. At the end of the day, a better user experience. Let's start with our big ones, with the two major features on this version. And the first one, is an NVR failover technology. In the former version, 18.1, uh, we introduced a redundancy option for the application server, which is the main system server in Valeris. That allowed a certain redundancy and protection. If that server fails, we can switch over to a redundant one and keep going. The next logical step and what this version is bringing with it 
is protecting recording. The NVRs, the recording servers, as we call them, also need a certain failover solution, and we would like to protect that recording in case an NVR fails. We wanted the solution, like everything that we do, to still be simple, both to program for the users and to use uh, for the end user sitting in front of the screen, and we'll show you that uh, what we've done. We decided uh, to utilize a dedicated failover NVR. So there is a machine, I'll show that uh, in more detail, that's acting as the failover machine. Instead of doing a load balancing or sharing on existing NVRs, and there's two good reasons for that. One is it keeps the whole failover logic very clear. We know who's protected, we know who's protecting, and we know how everything flows. The second one is that when we don't need to worry about extra resources for um, failure cases on the NVRs, we can fully utilize them at any given time because we know we have the backup for them. When we talk uh, uh, failover, I'd like to share some of, of the concepts that we were uh, thinking about and what we ended up doing so you understand that. The simplest way to do a failover, if we have an NVR, is obviously to have a 100% one-to-one ratio between the NVR and failover NVR backing them up. I'll give you uh, um, something to think about. When you talk rates, this is really parallel to doing a full mirror. When you do a rate, you have a drive and you have another drive that's protecting it. 100% protection, that's uh, the nice side of, the side of this. The other side is that it's pretty expensive to be doing 100% protection. So looking at other options, we go to the many-to-one failover solution, saying instead of having one-to-one, -one, we'll have a few NVRs and we'll back all of them up with one failover. This assumes, obviously, that not all NVRs will fail together. It's a statistical question, and it's really similar if you think about it. We're talking the drives and the RAID analogy. This is like RAID 5, having drives in RAID 5. We say, well, we allow ourselves to lose one drive uh, at any given time. We don't think that statistically we're going to lose more. It allows every user really to decide what ratio he wants to have for backing up. Some users will say, oh, I'll do two NVRs to one failover. Some will say five NVRs to one failover. Some will say 10. It's all up to the user and his level of protection and how he wants to set this up. It is much more cost effective than having in a one-on-one. -on -one. The more NVRs we're protecting with one single failover will be more cost effective, obviously. On the downside, we still might fall short if our statistical uh, prediction didn't really work as we planned, we might still find that we have more than one failed NVR and have a problem. The last option, and uh, this is really what we ended up going with, is to do uh, a many-to-many -many failover. If you think about it, it's sort of like RAID 6. I'm stretching this a little bit, but we can have multiple NVRs failover. In RAID 6, we can have two drives failover. That's the analogy. And we can have multiple failover NVRs waiting to pick them up. I'm going to switch now to the actual uh, Viconet system, Valeris system, I'm sorry, and show you how that looks uh, in Valeris itself and how we set it up. So I'm going to go into configuration. When I go here, just a note, uh, we added this splash screen, the home page as we call it, with nice big icons. The first time somebody goes into configuration, giving them a much brighter and bigger indication of where we're going. Here, I'm going to pick NVRs. By the way, the next time I'm going to go to configuration, it's going to take me where uh, to the same place I left configuration, just out of uh, a common sense. You can see that here in this demo, uh, I have three NVRs in my list. Two of them have those icons that you've seen before for NVRs, and one has a different icon with a plus on it. It's also labeled a failover NVR, unlike the regular NVR. So my failover gets added to the system the same way as an NVR and configuring it in terms of giving it the name and controlling what it has and even assigning storage because the failover needs to have storage is done in the same way that you do with a regular NVR. Now I'm switching to this failover NVR tab here. 
uh, which is new in uh, 18.2, it didn't exist before. You can see up top, we're giving a summary of how many NVRs are still in the system. You see two NVRs and one failover. And here we'll be building clusters for uh, failover purpose. So I'm gonna give this uh, first cluster a name, I'll call it building A. And the cluster has two sides. On the left here, you can see we're saying, which are the NVRs that you're trying to protect? In my case, these are the two that we saw before. I can pick one, I can pick both. It's a one-to-one, -one, many to many. We can do any of those configurations. And on the other side, we'll get a filtered list giving us all available failover NVRs. Here I have one, I'm gonna pick that one up and we just created the cluster of NVRs. This cluster of NVRs now works where the NVRs on the left are being monitored by the failover that's designated. If there's more than one, all of them are monitoring. If one fails, the failover is gonna kick in and start recording it. When it goes back online, the failover is gonna stop and give it back all his work. And if the other one fails, there's not gonna be in this case any coverage. It's like the RAID 5, we can lose one in VR because the other one is doing what it needs. This logic allows building as many clusters as we need one after the other. We can have the clusters for different buildings. We can have all NVRs in one cluster. We can have some that are protected with a one-to-one -one ratio while others are grouped and are being many-to-one or many-to-many. -many. We left it completely flexible so it can really meet any type of configuration that you're trying to achieve with your failover. The one very important thing to know at the end of the day the operator that's sitting in front of the system is not even aware of what was configured in the background in terms of failover. He does not need to know where did the certain uh, recording go. If there was a failure and it went to a different NVR and then it came back, Valeris will automatically bring back a clip. So if I'm playing back uh, a video clip at the time that the failure occurred, the user will still get his stream and we'll get the information. Apart from up to the 30 seconds, it's gonna take the switch over to actually happen. This system is fully automated in terms of the user. Same goes for export. You don't need to know that there was a failover and look for the data on different servers. All that is completely transparent to the user. This is really what failover is about. Extremely simple and very powerful. The NVRs, remember, are the same NVRs that we use for recording. They are designated when we install them. There's a configuration point where we say, you're gonna be a failover. From that moment on, that's how Valeris is gonna recognize it and you can build your clusters and move on. I'm gonna go keep going into the second big feature that we added here in 18.2, which is the Valeris Smart Analytics. This addition, this suite of solutions in the analytics range allows using a few modules to add capabilities to the VMS if you need them. You can see that we have three models. I'll discuss them separately and I'm gonna show you those separately. I am gonna go back and forth a little bit between the PowerPoint and the actual system uh, so you can see how it's implemented in there. Smart Action, that's the management application where really all the management of the analytics solution occurs, it holds the licensing, it's where the cameras are gonna be selected, it's where the rules are gonna be defined, it's where the real-time detections really take place and work. Smart search allows searching in an analytical way of uh, over play video that we recorded before, so really on playback, not on live, unlike the real-time. And business intelligence solutions that we can uh, utilize because we're collecting all that information. Before we take a look at those, let's just define and understand when we're looking at analytics, the biggest thing with analytics is really to take away that manual labor and time consuming tasks to look for something, whether it's looking at the live image and trying to identify something happened or even searching video that was recorded. If we have a system that can do that more efficiently uh, by computerized uh, ways, we will save that time we will save the effort of the users to get there. So that's the main purpose when it fits. From a topology point of view, before I look at the actual application, just to give you a quick understanding of what the topology is, I'm showing here uh, a slide 
that shows the analytic system running on the same hardware as the Valera system. This is supported. It really depends on different loads and calculation that our sales folks will help you when we design the system to do. In some cases, this will make sense. In other cases, it will make sense to dedicate servers for the analytics or use virtual machines, depending on the environment, will support any type of, analogy, of uh, architecture. Here on the left, you can see that we're running basically the Valeris application server as well as the smart analytics on the same hardware. On the NVR, same hardware, we'll be running our uh, VCA services, our content analysis services that really work the video and extract the metadata so it can be searched through, uh, trigger the real-time questions and all that. And between these two, they'll supply the clients, the Valeris client, as well as the analytics ones with video, live and playback, with tracking boxes to show where things happened, with alerts to be able to trigger rules, and so on. Let's talk about smart action first. Like I said before, smart action is the main module. It's really the administration one and the one in charge of the rule setup and the real-time detections. This is also where the licensing will be. And it's a centralized licensing like we have in Valeris itself. Quick look at some of the detections and the real-time things that we can set up in the system. A loitering and removed assets and line crossing suspicious objects and here on the right is actually capture of all those uh, behaviors that we can pick up in Valeris and respond to. Let's see how it looks in the actual system. So I'm going to show you the screen here is the screen for smart action. You can see it. I have a few clips that I populated to be able to show you, but a quick look behind the scenes here under the administrator side. This is the licensing area I mentioned, one license for the whole system. VMS server, this is where we integrate it to Valeris. We bring Valeris into this module, and you can see that we have a Valeris system on an IP address. It says connected, and there's 17 cameras that that system offers. If I look at the cameras themselves, we're going to pull a snapshot, and at this time, allow the person configuring the system to say which camera does he want to use for analytics. Not always use every camera. Which camera will have read time? Which have, camera will have search? Which camera will have both? All those are extremely flexible to pick and choose what is being analyzed and what isn't. So back to the front here, uh, I'm going to use one of, of the demonstration clips I prepared. Uh, let's take a look at the asset protection rule that I have set up here. So this is a clip it's going to play. You see the picture on the wall. We have the frame where we created the protection zone. You can see the rules say picture removed. And as soon as the picture gets taken off the wall, we will get an indication saying that object is removed. This indication is shown here, but it's also shown in Valeris. A person watching this camera on Valeris client, not even in the analytics itself, will get uh, this indication we'll see that uh, uh, blue box and we'll get a trigger, an event telling the system, hey, something happened. That event can be followed on and we can display the camera, we can move a PTZ, we can do all those actions that Valeris offers through the rule engine. Somebody that wants to use this interface, maybe without Valeris, using analytics only, or maybe uh, for uh, ease of use, or maybe we want to have certain users that only use the analytics, that's completely supported. You can see that we can uh, just hover the mouse and have a snapshot shown of where the event occurred, and I can even click and get playback. Same playback, I'm reminding you, can happen in Valeris itself. There's no need to jump back and forth. You can see it on both uh, screens, depending on what you need to see. Let's do uh, another example. Let's do the stop vehicle example here. You can see that, that the red zone that I've defined an area where if a car pulls to, uh, to the curb, to the shoulder, we'll get an indication. This is a highway. We want to make sure cars are not stopped and we can sell, uh, send uh, road services if needed. The stopped vehicle rule. And you'll see the car here pulling to the side. As soon as the system detects it again, you can set up how long does it need to stand there before it gets detected. Once detected, there's two things that happen. We get the visual box that's going to show around it. 
we're going to get a rule, uh, an event sent to Valeris. So if we're watching this in Valeris, that box is also going to show there, and we're going to get an event like we saw here. And now I can hover here and get a snapshot. I can do the same in Valeris. If I had rules in Valeris, I could now immediately send an email to a road service to go and pick them up if I want to do uh, uh, something like that. And if I'm working just on this platform, I can still use the same event, play it back, uh, see what happened, and use this as a full interface. Both ways will work pretty much the same. So these are real-time events. When we talk about smart search, we're really talking about events that we didn't plan for in real time. And the biggest problem with doing real-time events is that we need to know in advance to set up those rules. That, that car pulling to, uh, uh, to the side of the road, I had to set up my zone in advance knowing that's what I'm looking for. But there may be searches that I want to do without having that privilege of knowing in advance what I'm looking for. Those of you familiar with Vicon's museum search will find this uh, uh, pretty similar, but much stronger because of the analytics capabilities here that allow us to define much more elaborate rules. Also, when we're collecting that information, that metadata, from the cars moving, we have direction, we have numbers of cars crossing, we can get a lot of information out of that. That information can allow us to do some business intelligence analysis and create reports that show traffic volume in a certain area. They can show us uh, stores if we're talking about something like a retail store and we want to know how many people went through the store, which way did they go. I'm going to just demonstrate this in a minute. All these are pieces of information in the big data world today that we have by analyzing the video and working it through, and we can share and use them for a lot of smarts that we can work with. So back to the system here, I'm gonna um, open Valera Center. And if we have a camera set for search, right from that camera, we can launch search like we do thumbnail search or museum search or any other of those uh, searches. But we can also, and I'm doing that on purpose just to so show you where it's located in Valeris. We can also go to the search tab, and you'll see that we added a new entry here, which is analytic search. When I hit the button, it's going to launch our search application. This is a separate window to allow you to minimize it and uh, maximize it at need. And I'll put it full screen here and show you what it has. It looks fairly simple. You see that it's pretty strong behind this simplicity. Uh, I'm going to expand this more details just so you see how many options we have. And we can pick whether we search all the cameras, all the cameras that are designated for search, or we can pick a specific camera, which is typically what you will do. Here I'm going to pick uh, uh, the traffic circle one because it's it's good to show uh, the power. I'm going to plug in some time, and uh, uh, because this is recorded, just I'll put 900 days. And I'm going to search for, in this case, a vehicle not a person, not an object. Uh, I can choose the size of the vehicle. You have criteria for people and other things. And I look for vehicles moving. I can change the dwell time of that uh, car. I can ask to narrow down the search. All these are filters, so we'll get less uh, false alarms. I can choose color, I can choose size, I can do a date range. Running the query, uh, you will see we're getting results in thumbnails. These actually are thumbnails, and we're also zoomed into the cars that we're seeing here. I'm going to click the button just to show you that I can zoom out and show the whole view, or I'll zoom back in if I want to see better detail of these cars. Now I'm looking at these. This is very visual. If I'm looking for a specific, let's say, that van, I can double-click it and immediately get a clip right next to it showing me that van pulling in and why it was triggering the event that we're looking at. We can gather very uh, basic statistics even here on this app. I'll show you the report tool in a second there. When we go and do statistics, 
here because it's a demo I have one day with event, with events but if this was uh, a camera tracking that traffic circle all day long we will know how many hits we have at different days I can filter this by months by weeks by days and get different results I'm just showing you so you can see the tool itself the data in here being a demo is not very good this was days weeks and so on the next one and this is why the traffic circle shows that well those 45 detections that we have instead of showing thumbnails we can show a path for every one of those cars that we detected and you can immediately see trends you can see that more cars go uh, up and to the right less cars go around the uh, uh, traffic circle itself this gives you a very very quick look uh, of what's going on just from a traffic pattern we can take any one of these uh, these paths and click it to highlight it and get a little better view out of this big uh, red circle thing going on. This one, as you can see, clearly shows that we have a car here that made it a legal U-turn to the left here. And I can uh, click the uh, arrowhead and start the clip like we just did before and see that car doing the path that we're seeing right here. So as we play it, you'll see the car getting tracked, you'll see the box, uh, you see the indicator, and we'll see it going the wrong way here, as we have. Now, the car is pulling over here, and uh, you're going to see it gets, it doesn't even enter. It stops there, and if you look here on the left, you can actually see some of this yellow uh, line going back and forth, and a little bit. Car is standing there, other cars are moving, and it is pretty interesting. The reason I'm bringing this up is that the next thing I'm going to show is how we take the same results and in not seeing it in the path, uh, we're going to show them in a heat map. So we know there was a lot of stuff going on next to the gate there. We see it on the path and on the lines and on those things. But is there a more efficient way to do it? I switch to the heat map here and you can immediately see that where the car was standing, we have a red zone. Uh, this heat map is showing total staying time where the stuff just was standing there like the car that we had over there so we know that zone is red that's where most standing objects or vehicles in our case were there's a grid we can play with we can look for things other than uh, standing time we can look at dwell times we can look at other things uh, and get a heat map picture of those and when we look at the red we'll get the video of all those events that because of them the system determined this is a red zone there was a lot of staying around here and showing all that that's in my mind very powerful along with the path you can get a lot of information just by looking at it heat maps uh, I'm going to show another example in, uh, in a, a minute here uh, that shows uh, even a more interesting utilization for heat maps but the last one I was thing I want to show is video summary here are 45 detections from the search are shown sequentially so we'll see one after the other depending on the time they occurred sometimes this is very important just to see how many white cars went through the traffic circle something like that that's not what we looked for but uh, it could be i want to show you another example uh, but before that i want to show you the option to have queries i have a few queries here in the system that have been set up and the reason to have queries and to have them prepared is because in many many cases the searches that we do are always the same ones we come in in the morning and we want to see uh, how many vehicles were uh, parked on the curb next to the building overnight uh, we want to see how many people went the wrong way on the tsa lane all these things are regular queries and that's the ability to create a query and to save it and just to run it like this instead of having to program everything every time saves time and uh, saves you know makes everything do the same as you need it. so i'm going to run this query that was prepared in advance and you can see this query is actually on multiple cameras uh, it's easy to see here that you're getting detections on different cameras that we have in the store and from those cameras i'm now going to pick one of them and i'm going to show you how the path looks here and the nice thing here is that we embedded this on top of what could be the store map not the best map i uh, picked but if this was a store map and i now see that i have a certain path 
I can analyze things like where do people come into my store, which door is more popular, which direction do they go, which shelves do they walk next to. All that in retail can be worth a lot of money. If we charge by a certain shelf, we know uh, uh, which are the hot ones. And speaking of heat, the heat map in a, uh, such a store is even more powerful than we saw it before. If I can get a heat map telling me where are the hot zones for people in this case in my store, I can understand if I have a bottleneck, maybe people get stuck there. Maybe there's something really interesting there. Maybe it's a product that attracts attention. Maybe I need to give it a better place in my store. All these are tools that together show the power of analytics, not only on the security side. Obviously, we can do many, many things like that with security, even map with security of a school where people go, where they linger, uh, and where they go around. But way more than just doing uh, security proper implications. Before we continue here, uh, one last tool that I mentioned before is the ability to take all this information and generate reports out of it. Like everybody else, people using these systems, even though they're sophisticated and all, it's hard to follow all the data that's in there. The report tool allows creating reports from time to time with everything that you need based on the rules you have set in the system. You can see them in the, at the bottom there. Standard system reports in a PDF type form or even go and create extended Excel type reports. And the nice thing about Excel is like we all know it's easy to com control. We can do anything we want with those Excels and follow up on things. Management reporting, trends that we, we want to follow, all these can be uh, created from here. I'm not going to show the reports. I think that's pretty clear by itself. Okay, so let's jump back and talk about some of those enhancements, which are uh, maybe look smaller, but some of them are very significant to the user experience. We talked about this uh, homepage, just a, a little example of something that helps uh, navigating the system and being more efficient instead of looking through smaller icons. Another piece that we worked on extensively in this version, little small things that come to a big picture, is control of alarms. The first thing we did is we looked at the need to have additional contacts. In the old analog days, the DVRs even and the encoders had a lot of contacts, inputs and outputs, which we could tie to things like a doorbell or even to fences. In IP systems, uh, because the IP camera tend to have one or even not even that, inputs and outputs, uh, there's a need for more. So we're utilizing this ADAM6050. This is a standard uh, unit, which is an IP2IO solution. And what this unit allows us to do is really allows us to increase the number of inputs and outputs on our system without having to do it through cameras. They're not getting automatically discovered like cameras would, so we need to do it through the add device manually. But you'll see that when I pick my NVR that will manage it, we add it on the list here at the bottom, our Atom 6050 unit. Once I pick it and I supply Valerus with its IP address, it will get added to the whichever NVR that manages it. That's kind of the same like cameras. And it's going to become uh, another device in the system. Now, when we go into the resources here, digital inputs, relay outputs, those are going to automatically show in there. There's no need to know exactly where they came from and what device is managing them. Valeris just uses them and says, you have a resource. You can do whatever you need with your resource anytime you need, including rules. If I want to open the door when somebody buzzes, all those are controllable. Not all systems, and that's why we're going to the second one, are contact-based. More of them today are not contact-based, and that's why we wanted to allow also to receive external text-like events. Systems like uh, access control, license plate systems, intercom, a lot of these systems today, when they have a certain event occur, they know how to send it over the network so we can process it in Valeris. What we did here, I'm going to go into resources and you're going to see another new entry for uh, 18.2. 
which is called external events. What we're doing here is we are actually defining what we call listeners. I made one for access control and another one for license plate. It can be multiple listeners, it can be one, depending on what we want to listen in on. These listeners are really IP ports waiting for that event from the third party to come in so we can do something with it. The events are typically sent today uh, either by JSON, which is JavaScript, text, plain text, or XML. That's the typical three ways that you'll see events being sent over the networks. And of course, the, it requires a little bit of understanding between the external system and Valera saying, hey, how do you guys send your information so we know how to listen for it? But once it's set up, we can now count on these and create rules based on that information that's coming from the third party systems. So when I go into rules, I'll show you how uh, it looks when I create a rule now. Uh, like we do a relay or we do an input physical one, I'll do a rule here and I'll say, uh, I want to specify the event, I'll say external event up here. And when I do that, the system says, okay, select which one of these listeners you want to use. I can do one, I can do multiple, depends on how it's set up. And let's say I want to use the LPR and say, um, I want to know when I received an event that contains a blacklist. If I read the plate, then it's in my blacklist. Now I can specify what I want to do when that occurs. I can display a camera, I can display a view, uh, I can say which view. And another addition here in 18.2 is that we can also designate which users. It can be all of them like before. In 18.1, it was mandatory. All users would get that action, that view. Or in 18.2, I can actually say, okay, I want to pick and choose which users are going to get that action when I get my blacklist. It might be administrators, it might be one building except and, and not the other. This allows us to do that. That's another 18.2 addition. At the end of this, there's a question of how does it look and how does the user feel when he gets an event? How does he know there is an event occurring? get attention, we got some feedback from users out there and we decided that we need to uh, enhance some of how it looks. So if I'm a user and I'm looking at my screen here, I want to know when there's an alarm, when something happened and was triggered by that rule. It doesn't necessarily mean the input matters, but it means I need to know. So I've set up, just so I can show you here, I've set up a button here, called it alarm resource, alarm source. And when I flip it, you'll see how it generates an alarm view. And what we do is the alarm opens in a designated tab. We call it, surprisingly, the alarm tab. The alarm tab now is colored red. The alarm picture itself is circled red. You can see the flash up there uh, that we added to get attention. And also you can't hear it on the webinar, but there is an audible uh, indication of the alarm. So if it's minimized of, uh, the guard dozed off or doing something else, he will get an audible alarm. We can also, if he's on a different screen here and doesn't see the video, you can see I'll use that switch to alarm option and it's going to take me right to the alarm. Because we're web uh, uh, browser based and we want to work across multiple monitors, if I take my alarm monitor and I move it into another monitor and designate it now by it being my alarm monitor, uh, that's where all the alarms are going to open. That tab is going to be designated to do all that. So that kind of wraps the whole alarms. More inputs, both physical and logical, and better way to handle what that alarm does, how it comes into the system, how can I build my rules with everything the rules can do, who gets the rule, who sees the video, who gets an email, all those things are wrapped under this solution. A few more enhancements. I'm going to go through these quickly and then show you those uh, in, in one shot. Uh, one is we created a device report, which is really an S-build report in Excel that you can get out of the system. We tell you which NVRs are in there, which cameras belong to which NVR, their details. I'll show you that uh, right away. Uh, we added some sort shortcuts. That was a user's uh, feedback uh, that allows jumping back and forth between devices and resources. I'll show that. We're now allowing to add more than two streams per camera. I'll demonstrate that. 
And we're also allowing to move cameras between NVRs so I can load balance and do other things. So first is this Excel. You can see that you actually put an Excel icon here. And when we hit that, it generates a report of all the NVRs in the system, all the cameras tied to those NVRs and their details. Uh, it's a simple Excel. You need to have Excel, obviously, to open it, but it generates it even if you don't have Excel on that machine. So you can take it somewhere else and view it. Uh, I'm going to open uh, the Excel that I have here. This is, I have one NVR with, uh, with my simulator on it, so there's not a lot showing in this report. But you can imagine if we have multiple NVRs and each had different cameras on it, the information here, whether we look at it from the All tab or a designated uh, NVR tab, we have both down the bottom. You can get the version on, on those cameras and devices. You can get, uh, we're adding MAC address that was a request from the field. You can get their uh, uh, IP addresses and so on. The next thing that I mentioned was the shortcuts. Uh, the complaint that we got, which was very, very reasonable, was that if I'm working here on a device, say I'm doing something with my simulator, and I want to jump to one of its resources, one of its video channels, I would have to go in 18.1 uh, to the resources on the left, find video channels, find my channel, and it is pretty laborious. So what we did now and what you can do, we added on the right shortcuts. So when you pick a device, you get a shortcut to all those, of those devices' resources. In my case, the 17 cameras we've seen before, I have a few audio inputs and a couple of digital inputs and outputs. I can just pick the one I want and I'll just take a video, for example, and you see that it automatically jumps to that page under resources and gets us right in there. A big, probably saves five clicks and looking around. Here is a good opportunity to show you uh, the analytics services that uh, uh, we're indicating right in this property space. So because we say the analytics is per channel, it's not something that we necessarily have uh, for every one of our channels. Here we get an indication whether this channel has analytics, does it have real time, does it have search, so you can know which one have what. There is an equal shortcut down below that will take you back to the device if you want to go, like we go did device to resource and resource to device. Next here, I'm going to go into streams. We'll talk about that third stream. By default, this is what you had in Valeris before, two streams max. Not all cameras have additional streams, but some do. Uh, so we added the button there at the bottom, which is add streams, and it's not a dumb move. It actually talks to the device and says, do you have more streams to offer apart from what we already use? In my case, it's a simulator. It says, I don't have available options. But if I had a camera and it said, here are your options, you would actually get a list of options to pick from, and you would be able to add a stream to the system. So no longer too limited. We can do three streams where needed. And last, I'm going to jump back to my NVR tab here, and you can see this new button here, Move Devices. Like I said, before, up to 18.2, if you wanted to move a camera from one NVR to the other because you needed to do some load balancing, or because uh, you didn't have enough storage on one NVR, or because it's in a different building, or anything like that, you would have to remove it and re-add it. Here we just added a Move option, where you get a list of all NVRs that are candidate you can move to, and it automatically moves it and it keeps it extremely simple and completely transparent to the user. Next two things are updated authorization. We made changes to how we handle the authorization of who sees what, who gets to do what on the system. This was done. Uh, based on a lot of uh, excellent feedback we got from customers. And the big difference that we made here is we changed from a permissive approach where when you add a camera, it will be open to everybody until the admin closed it to a restrictive approach where you add a camera, it's closed for everybody uh, until the admin says otherwise. By the way, it's not only cameras, it's any resource on the system. The reason was that uh, we, we had cases where you would add a camera and the admin wasn't fast enough to go and say block, 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 and some people could see video from places they're not supposed to. So here, they can't see anything until the admin says so. Important to say and important to understand, if you're upgrading from 18.1 
to 18.2, it will automatically migrate everything. You're not going to lose any permissions that you created in the system. We'll take care of that. It automatically moves and moves over. The second thing that uh, uh, we did here to simplify how that screen looks, uh, and I don't have a side-by-side -side comparison, but uh, I'll go into user management here. You can see that we changed the term that was here called user groups to uh, authorization roles, and we bundled everything under it. And the roles are really templates of who gets to see what. I can create a role, I can decide what that role can do, and assign and take off users as much as I need. We have the system users in here, and we have roles, uh, system roles, and the roles that you can create on your own, like the ones you see at the bottom there um, that I've created. Like we said, everything is going to be off, not permitted, until you say otherwise. And if you want it to say otherwise, you can pick the role that you want to change, and you can go and make your changes with these buttons on the right. So if I want to provide search options to building a users, I can just flip that button and allow it to do, or I can close it, or any way around. Once the role is created, I can assign the users that are part of that role, and all those users under role will have the same privileges. I can have all users, I can have some users, men's wing, women's wing, anything that I want to do. Up top, you'd see that we have two tabs. We have system authorization. This used to be two screens in 18.1, and resource. Resources are any resources, cameras, microphones, uh, web pages, anything here. The admin will need to go and turn on for the right role, but it's not that tedious because he can, if he wants, turn everything on in one shot. You can see the button, uh, on-off buttons on the top. You can do a multiple select and say these cameras and turn them on in one shot. And you can uh, even duplicate one role to the other. If they're very similar, you can say, okay, I'll duplicate it and then make uh, slight changes to keep things simple. The turn to role here, for those of you who programmed the system before, uh, will save a lot of user time. And that's why I said that sometimes things that can be considered cosmetic, I'm just playing around to show you the capabilities, uh, some things that can be considered cosmetic are actually saving time money and keeping the picture to whoever administers the system much much simpler last thing here uh but not least is log collection uh till 18.2 we had a log collection tool that we offered to anybody that uh, wanted uh, that we needed logs from say they call tech support tech support need logs to help them out there was a tool that we sent out and you had to run to the machine and use it We've now embedded the log collection tool right into Valeris, so you have it right here. It can do an all log collection, or you can do a selective one and say, uh, I just want to log, uh, get logs for a specific NVR. We always bring the application server in. The log files are not big. They're text files, or they're, we're not talking about big, but you get them all in one spot, and if tech support needs them, it means that you can get them quicker. Uh, you don't have to run to the machine, and we can then help you much faster. With all these things that we've done here and everything we're adding, because we're moving forward and really are building the system up to be uh, more of an enterprise answer, while keeping an eye and making sure that all the smaller system have what they need, we've decided to add another license tier. So try Core and Pro were our licensed tiers before. We added another tier, top tier in this case, called Enterprise. Right now, under Enterprise, we have the analytics and we have the failover NVRs, but things, as we keep developing, may fall under uh, the existing core, pro, everybody, and may just fall under Enterprise if we feel their Enterprise features and the pricing is going to be accordingly. We can protect from people who don't need certain features having to pay the full licensing. So the new tier is there. Updating from existing tier to the new tier is very, very simple uh, using our centralized software. And if you have a UPP, our upgrade protection plan in place, is actually very cost effective. Viking Sales can help you with that. Before I take questions, I want to give you a really a sneak peek at our uh, new cameras and additions that we're doing here. And as we said in the beginning, we are a solution provider and we have all the solutions. So 
keeping up with all the latest camera technology and everything that comes uh, uh, out in the market, we are adding a few really, really nice cameras to the current list. Uh, you will see that there's a selection of form factors, but the, most of them are based around our existing form factors. We're trying to keep everything in the family. Starting with a 4K line, monitors in 4K are something that uh, have become really a commodity. There's, there's nothing exotic about those. The cameras took a little bit of time, but right now we can offer excellent cameras, both in a dome and a bullet form factor. And you can look at the spec here, read a sneak peek at the spec here below, and see that you're getting excellent specs for a 4K camera. Uh, these are things that were very hard to achieve before, and these cameras would do it. Microdome, uh, another very growing uh, market where people want to have something with, this, with a small footprint, something that is very aesthetical. Some places the bigger cameras are not really uh, what you need and at the right price point. These, however, don't give up on their performance. You can see that we're offering these in a two and a four megapixel. Uh, option, they have true WDR. It's a fixed lens because of the size here. It's really hard uh, to do anything other than fixed lens. But the light sensitivity and everything that this camera offers in it is really, really high end. Another very trendy thing, multi-sensor domes. Unlike uh, the wonderful panoramic ones that we can de-warp and we do things with, this one really has four sensors, high resolution in there. We're offering this camera in an 8 and a 20 megapixel version. The 8 is four 2 megapixel sensors. The 20 is for 5 megapixel sensor where you can get a 180 degree phenomenal picture out of this uh, camera. And we're soon to add to uh, a 270 degree and a 360 degree version to the line. Uh, we know that's something that has a lot of interest in it. Once more, the camera offers the right specs for a security camera. This is not really a, a low end solution at all. In the PTZ arena, uh, the surveyor is now uh, being moved to this SN240 model, and this is a full PTZ, 2 megapixel, 30x optical with true WDR. And one nice thing this camera also offers right now, it offers uh, an analog video out, a composite, so it can be in some places used uh, for that. We've seen that need before. Another PTZ is the Cruiser, it used to be a 663, now it's a 693. It's an outdoor camera. Uh, it's a smaller form factor camera, uh, not the full size. It's 2 megapixel, 23x optical on top of that, and a very, very impressive 200 feet IR range. Uh, other specs, a little bit of analytics and other things that it can do, but for a small PTZ, a really, really good value for money. And the bigger one, the bigger brother, replacing our 680s for those uh, of you who knew it, uh, is now with a 3 megapixel sensor as well as a 1300 feet IR throw. This is like a flashlight. This is an outdoor IR illuminator with a PTZ bundled together. Really, really strong solutions for where you need that distance and has everything in the book for uh, a PTZ. So we can get... Uh, Ready to answer some questions. I am trying to keep in the time here. Um, I'm going to jump right to some of the questions that I see here. Uh, training. Good question on training. Yes, uh, we absolutely have training available. We actually launched a full online training program. And uh, you guys need to go on our website and check it out. You register. You can certify yourself or you can just go through training, whatever you need. Um, Question on analytics, is there a limit for number of cameras per analytic server? Yes, there is a limit. Uh, these analytic servers have certain horsepower to handle the analytics. So there is uh, a certain formula that we can help with, say, if they're running a dedicated or running with the NVRs, how many you can run and so on. But uh, that number is not unlimited. I have a question here about uh, 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 mapping devices. I made mention of that a little bit on the enterprise. Maps, interactive maps that we can use and work with uh, is something that's coming in the next version. Uh, I'm sure that in our next webinar at the beginning of the year, that's going to be a main focus point. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just reading as we do. 
question about uh, does Valera support the combination of IP cameras as well as analog cameras? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Valera supports analog cameras through encoders. We offer encoders that tie into Valera. So if you have existing analog cameras or even if you have to uh, want to add uh, new, we have HD analog cameras that we offer and it can be used uh, side by side. Really, Valera doesn't care what the source is, if it's IP or through an encoder. Uh, a question about do you have to buy the analytics package? Uh, no, you don't have to. You can really look at your system and decide whether you need analytics at all. And if you do, which cameras you need it on and make uh, uh, conscious decisions on where to use it, how to use it, and uh, and how to do uh, really mix and match what you're using and decide how much you want to spend on that. Can uh, multiple analytics rules, oh, there's a lot of interesting analytics here, apply to one camera? The answer is yes. Uh, the system is not limited to a single rule. You can, if you choose, do multiple rules, say uh, line cross as well as loitering, things like that. And if I'm a pro user, we're talking about the license tier of Valeris, how do I upgrade to the enterprise tier? The upgrade itself is actually really, really simple. As soon as you order, the upgrade, whatever it is for you, depending if you have UPP, don't have UPP, uh, all, all that sales process is completed. We update your license in our centralized license server, and all you have to do is reactivate your system like you did when you originally activated it. Because it's centralized, you keep your same activation key, the system doesn't really change, but your tier is going to be updated. So it's extremely, extremely simple to do. Uh, question is the ability to playback recorded video uh, get affected if an NVR failover is triggered? So I kind of touched on it when we talked about that, but the answer is no, except for that failover time, which is uh, up to 30 seconds will take the failover to kick in. For the user, uh, there is no effect. You'll have a little gap when it took, uh, went back uh, to the failover and then it's going to keep playing and the system will automatically route the data from where you need it. Again, I'm scrolling through the questions, trying to see if I can find things I can quickly answer. Uh, there's a question on, on what's the license fee on the analytics. Uh, th this is something you need to take up with your vice and sales rep. Uh, it, it really depends on what you're trying to do and what you're implementing. There's different prices for uh, different things that the analytics can provide you. So it's not a, not a fixed number that I can answer. Um, what's the system requirements for a failover NVR? That's another good one. Uh, the failover NVR is exactly the same machine as the regular NVR. So from a spec, it's the same thing. You just install it and designate it to be our regular NVR. Today is an i7 with 16 uh, gigabytes of RAM. Nothing special. Um, same goes for the failover. So I am running out of time. I did uh, uh, try and catch some of, of the more important answer uh, questions, but I will, like we do always, we will answer questions and post them so uh, everybody can see the Q&A of everything that was sent in. Thank you very much, Guy. I also wanted to end, we'll reply to questions that were unanswered via email individually as well. Um, we want to really thank everyone today. We appreciate you being here and taking your time to listen to our presentation. At the end, please take a moment to participate in a very short survey. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure.